Okay, next up is uh, the analysis of emerging video codecs. Uh, that's a joint paper between two fellows at uh, Ericsson. Um, we have uh, Midrick Blestal and Julian Tenouf. And uh, I'll introduce and uh, get on with him next. Julian? So hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to present uh, our analysis of emerging video codecs uh, beyond HEVC, uh, namely AV1 and VVC that we got in introduction. Um, and I will, uh, will try to compare uh, the main coding tool introduced in this codex, uh, talk about compression efficiency and complexity. So this is the outline of the presentation. Um, I will first introduce, uh, try to introduce an history of video codecs and standards uh, for the last uh, 30 years. Um, I will spend some time on discussing on the difficulty of comparing video codecs. Um, I will briefly um, give a list, a short list of the main codec tools uh, introduced in AV1 and in GEM as a VVC reference point. So just to, to point out that in this presentation, in this work, we use the uh, uh, GEM uh, explorability model as a reference point for VVC uh, because at the time we prepared this work as a VTM, uh, so the official VTM reference software was not available. Um, and we will report our objective performance analysis um, with uh, two implementation of the HEVC standards using an open source 265 uh, encoders and the reference software for HEVC, HM as well as the reference software for AV1 and GEM for the reference points of VVC. Uh, we'll complement uh, this objective performance analysis uh, with some subjective quality assessment of HVC versus AV1 compressed stream uh, before to summarize the work and conclude. So um, in these two timeline, uh, I tried to summarize um, about 30 years of codec development um, and uh, we, can, we, try, we, we can actually uh, oppose uh, two lines of developments. So uh, the main, the first line of development is the one uh, uh, developed by the well-known uh, standardization bodies organization, which is uh, ISO, IEC, and ITUT, um, and uh, supported by their working group, a joint working group uh, from MPEG and VKEG. Uh, they are well, most well-known for their joint codex, so H.264 EVC, and uh, the uh, state-of-the-art uh, standard codec, which is H.265 HEVC. Uh, basically, to this line of development, we can oppose uh, another line of development, which gathering, uh, which are counter-dust codecs, with gathering some uh, propriety codecs, like some technology from uh, real video or onto technologies, um, some uh, codecs from some other uh, standardization body, like SMPT, with the VC uh, codec family, and some open source uh, royalty free codecs like the Google VP8, VP9, some more recent codecs from, Dahala, uh, from Mozilla, Dahala, uh, the Cisco Tor codecs, and so on. So, the year uh, 2018 actually have been a, a rich, rich full uh, year in terms of um, codec design activities and announcements, with as reported by the two previous presenter, uh, in April 2018, uh, the joint expert video team, which is the, the joint working group from MPEG and VKEG, uh, in response to a call for proposal uh, for technology beyond HEVC, announced uh, their start for, the announced start for work on a new standard, so Versatile Video Codex, with complexion uh, expected by October 2020. Mostly in the meantime, in March 2018, the Alliance for Open Media, which is a consortium from a big name from the uh, internet industry, uh, announced the release of our media video codec version 1, RV1, an open source royalty free video codex that ambition to compete uh, HEVC standard. So the main motivation of this work is to answer to the question uh, how the latest video codec using GM as a reference point for VVC and RV1 compares with HEVC. Uh, before to go through uh, the rest of the presentation, I think it's important to recall uh, what is the scope of video standardization. Um, we have to point out that uh, video standard only specifies the B-stream, syntax, and decoding process. It permits any optimization beyond the obvious. 
It permits complexity reduction for the implementability and provides no guarantee of quality by itself. So it means that all the pre-processing step, encoding optimization or post-processing error recovery, are let free to, uh, uh, for example, to encode our vendors. Um, and it's what will make the difference at the end uh, to, to compare to encoder implementation. Coming back to comparing uh, video codec performance, I want to highlight the difficulty of comparing video codecs. Uh, you may have read or heard of a number of public recent publications in 2018 uh, that have tried to compare, uh, that have compared uh, uh, AV1 performance with HEVC. Uh, if you look at all these uh, studies uh, that have been published in either in some technical conference, from uh, various bodies, from people from Facebook, Bitmovie, Netflix, some well-known university, you will see, if you try to summarize all this work, you will see that some of them said claims that AV1 is much better than HEVC. Some of them um, uh, provide some results with a more balanced conclusion that said that AV1 is grossly on par with HEVC. And some of them say that AV1 is much worse than HEVC in terms of compression performance. So all these results have been published in 2018. And just highlight, like when you when you have to compare to try to compare video codex performance, it's it's quite difficult. Uh, I basically tried to, to to summarize what could be the key points of divergence when it comes to comparing video codecs. So the first point is uh, st the use of standard versus encode the confusion between standard versus encoder implementation. Um, Basically, a stand, when you design a standard, uh, it's also provided on the side a reference implementation, like the HM for HVC, uh, the GUM for VTM for VVC, and AOM ONC for IV1. But you may also have some uh, free uh, open source um, optimized encoder, like X264 for, for uh, IVC, X265 for HVC, that are, are published and provide uh, uh, result um, and provide on the side. So the main point between all this implementation is that don't rely on the cell level of encoding optimization. And this encoding op optimization, we have seen that are non-normative. They are out of the scope of the standards. So the, it may a, a first point of divergence when you, when you try to compare codecs. The second point of, codec, uh, of divergence is the uh, codec configuration itself. Uh, depending on what type of application you want to target, uh, you may configure differentiality in your codec. So, for example, if you want to target live broadcasting, VOD, adaptive streaming, you may not configure your codec in the same, in the same way. So it means that targeting different bit rates, using different rate, col rate control operation mode, by the way, rate control is outside the scope of the standard also, uh, using different gob structure scheme, uh, picture, picture stem or refer ref referencing scheme, and so on. Uh, different implementation, different codecs also provide different um, uh, non-normative tuning. Like you may want, you may it may be possible to to, to tune or optimize uh, the score of some specific metrics. Uh, you may uh, use a multiple pass uh, strategy to improve the efficiency of your encoders, and so on. Uh, another point is: uh, Do you use in your implementation some uh, SEM low-level acceleration for accelerating the encoding runtime, for instance, using SEMD instruction? Do you use uh, multi-threading or not? All these points uh, may end up with uh, confusing results at the end when you compare two different implementations. The third point of divergence uh, is the use which metrics you will use to benchmark uh, your uh, objective quality or your uh, complexity. Uh, in terms of objective quality, there is many metrics available. So the main one is PCNR, but you have also some uh, uh, metrics more correlated with the, uh, with the human vision system, like SSIM, uh, more recently VMAF. Uh, you may compute uh, this. You may um, compute this score on uh, the luminance plane only, on a combination of the three plane, uh, luminance and chrominance plane. Um, you may want to complement this objective quality scores with some subjective quality assessments. And for the complexity, you can estimate in different ways, either estimating them, taking in account uh, the memory usage, execution, execution times, or only the number of elementary operations that you need to, to process uh, the, the, a given block. And last point, but not least, um, uh, the test sequence itself that you, you use for your evaluation. We perfectly, all, everybody knows that a codec performs differently better for different contents. And so the variety of the test sequence you will, uh, you will use for your evaluation is a key point uh, for uh, the, the validity of your, your study. So in this paper, um, which test condition we used? Uh, 
Basically, in terms of encoder implementation, we use reference implementation for HEVC, VVC, and uh, V1. And we add a second point for HEVC, which is uh, uh, we use the X265 open source codex. So it's an optimized HEVC encoder. And the aim of using a second point for HEVC is just to highlight how we can uh, end up with different uh, coding performance for two implementations of the same standard. In terms of codec configuration, uh, we left away uh, 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 as much as possible all the uh, encoding optimization and non-normative uh, uh, algorithms like rate control. So we use constant QP operation mode for that, uh, looking f uh, using five QP points that spam a large bitrate uh, range. Uh, we use a random access scenario. It means like we use a hierarchical B-frame GOP structures, uh, open GOP structures. We try as much as, much as possible to not modify the default configuration of each codec in order to not misconfigure uh, uh, one, one codec against another. Um, and also we disable all, for the complexity measurement, we disable all the SEMD instruction. Basically, in the different codecs, uh, they rely not on the same level of um, optimization in terms of low-level instruction. So, for instance, the HM or GM use SEC2 instructions, while the AV1 codecs use AVX2 instructions that are much, much more faster. So we try to disable everything to have a fair comparison. And every codec has been operated in, in single thread. So you can refer to the paper for more detail about the command lines. Um, regarding matrix by itself, uh, we use for objective score, we use a weighted YUV, PSNA, and SAM, SSM score. And we complement uh, this um, objective uh, analysis with some uh, subjective assessment. Uh, using a pair comparison uh, of AV1 and HVC streams, uh, which is in the methodology which is very similar to the shootout methodology that is used in the industry to compare two encoder vendors. For the complexity estimation, we only use encoding and decoding runtimes. For the test seconds, we try to choose a, a, a large range of sequences that cover uh, the most of the sequences you can find in the broadcast or uh, OTT distribution industry. Um, so you can refer to the paper for the list of the sequences. About coding tools, uh, I will not go very deep in details in all the details of the co each coding tool in each codex, but what I want to point out is that basically HEVC, AV1, or VVC are all block-based hybrid video codex. So they are all based on the same generic, generic coding schemes. So you can find the, uh, the at least uh, the six, six um, core blocks, which are the transform quantization, uh, first the picture partitioning into blocks from, of uh, variable sizes, uh, the, the intra or inter prediction, uh, the transform and quantization of the residual from the intra inter prediction, and uh, some in loop filtering uh, to improve the prediction and uh, the lossless entropy coding. So the main point is that the, the basic scheme of uh, video codecs didn't change since uh, for 30 years. Uh, yes, so I will not go very deep in, in the main coding tools, uh, but I try to, to shortlist the main coding tools being HVC. Again, uh, for uh, VVC, we use the GRM reference points. It may have moved uh, uh, during the year, uh, so it's not uh, an up-to-date list. Um, but uh, basically, what point we can see is that AV1 and GM uh, share common uh, tools. So they basically improve the picture partitioning uh, using some rec recursive quaternary and binary splitting of uh, uh, the picture, as they use uh, larger blocks up to uh, 128 by 128. Um, they uh, improve the motion uh, prediction, uh, basically as mentioned by JitBoys, uh, by uh, uh, using higher model, uh, higher prediction model to be able to predict uh, non translational uh, uh, motion. Um, and they also increase the number of intra prediction modes, the number of uh, DCT, DST uh, transforms that you could put in competition to improve the transformation and so on. Uh, the number of in loop filter also have increased in comparison to HEVC, and the uh, uh, binary, uh, the arithmetic encoder has been uh, improved. So, uh, reporting objective coding efficiency. So this is our, our measurements. So you have two tables, one for uh, based on SSEM scores, one on based on uh, PSNR quality scores. So um, basically, it provides uh, bitrate saving or overhead, bitrate overhead uh, uh, over the HM for the same uh, quality point. So if you look at the X2, for uh, X265, 
um, basically uh, we, re we report 35% overhead in bitrate in comparison to HM, HEVC, for the same SSEM or PSN air quality. Uh, for RV1, we report uh, objectively 10% uh, bitrate saving over HM for the same, again, SSEM or PCN scores quality. And for the GEM, as a projection of what could, as a, a reference point for VVC, uh, we report 27% uh, bitrate saving uh, for the same PCN quality and SSEM quality. Uh, one point that we can notice is that uh, RV1 or GEM uh, performs a bit better uh, for higher resolutions and lower resolution. Regarding encoding and decoding runtimes, so we, we measure encoder, run we, we compute encoder runtime factors over the HM and decoder runtime factors over the HM. So basically, uh, first I recall uh, for all um, the runtime measurement, we disable the SSMD acceleration for HM, GM, and RV1 in order to have a fair comparison. Uh, just as a information, uh, X265, is, this configuration of X265 is running uh, 30 times faster than the HM. Regarding the GEM, uh, which is, uh, it's 10 times slower than the HM. For RV1, it's measured, it's reported uh, 55, 55 times slower than uh, AHM in terms of encoding runtime. When you look at the decoding runtime, uh, the GEM is seven times slower uh, than the HM, while RV1 is, has roughly the same running uh, decoding runtime than the HM. So again, uh, as mentioned by Jill Boyce before, uh, the, 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 this number for the GEM as a reference point for VC have been updated and are much more faster now. So overall, if we try to summarize the overall encoder performance, we measure over the HM. So X265 is 34% bitrate overhead for same SSEM quality while being 30 times faster than the HM. So again, X265, it's one implementation of the standard HEVC. So we see that we then end up with very different results for two different encoder implementation of the same standard. AV1 is reported to be 10% bitrate, to allow 10% bitrate saving for same SSCM quality while being 50 times uh, slower. And again, uh, GM is uh, about 20, allow, uh, allows uh, about 27% bitrate saving for same SSCM quality while being 10 times uh, slower than GHM. So in that regard, we can expect that uh, the projections that the, the last release of VVC uh, will provide about 40 to 50% bitrate saving over the HM for an increase uh, in uh, encoding runtime of about three to, uh, for factor three or four, which is the target. So uh, we try to, com to, to complement, to consolidate this objective analysis uh, with subjective quality assessment focused on AV1 and HVC compressed stream. For this, we use a pair comparison uh, of um, these two teams, uh, very similar, as I said, to the VQ shootout uh, methodology that is used to, to, to differentiate compete two encoder vendors in the industry. So basically, uh, we put uh, side by side two encoded streams, AV1 and HEVC, and we asked to 20 subjects, so 10 video experts and 10 non-experts, non uh, to pick up uh, uh, their preference. Uh, either uh, AV1 is better, or HEVC is better, or there are no preference between them. Um, for this um, uh, evaluation, we use a subset of the pre previous test set, picking up uh, five full, full HD uh, sequences of 10 second length uh, that we loop six times. Uh, for these five uh, full HD sequences, Two of them have a uh, shows, uh, shows a limited AV1 gain over HM, and three of them had significant AV1 gain over HM, more than 10% bitrate saving. So what we want to try with this, with this evaluation is to see if objective gain of AV1 over HM translates in terms of subjective uh, quality uh, gain, um, in terms of subjective quality gain. So for this evaluation, we only picked up uh, one target bitrate per second, um, which, uh, which is, which we try to match uh, a, a typical uh, quality versus speech rate trade-off uh, that is usually used for OTT distribution market. So it's a bit rate, target bit rate between uh, two to three megabits per second. So the results, so the trend is that 42% of the viewers have no preference between HEVC and AV1. And 48% of the viewers uh, preferred HEVC. 
So basically, we can conclude from this that objective bidder rate gain of AV1 do not necessarily translate into subjective quality gains. And we even observe a slight advantage to HEVC for the considered tested NB trade. In order to, to, to better understand um, this trend, uh, <coughs> we ask to ask each uh, viewers um, to put, uh, to, to show us uh, the area uh, where they saw, they notice some visible difference between AV1 and HEVC and they have, mot and which have motivated their choice. So basically what I've, we try to summarize what have been reported, but for example, uh, you have the area one or two. Um, basically what is reported is that like, uh, in the background on the trees uh, is that AV1 is much more blurry and uh, a lot of temporal artifact is observed, like intra-pulsing. So you have a refresh in quality uh, temporal, uh, periodically that makes a, a, a pumping effect which is very annoying. Uh, in the other way around, uh, near the, the face of the kimono girl, um, uh, much more blockiness have, and ringing have been observed uh, on HEVC in comparison to AV1. Another example of uh, the ritual dance sequences uh, report more or less the same trend. Uh, on the arm of the drummers, uh, HM have, have been, uh, HEVC have been reported much more blocky, uh, and uh, while uh, uh, in the background and the faces of the character in the background, AV1 has been reported uh, much more blurry. Uh, so again, for this sequence, uh, the subjective trend is very uh, balanced. So it's very difficult to, to, to it's very subjective, like uh, which uh, compressed team you prefer, as a AV1, as a HEVC while uh, the, the gain reported, the objective gain reported are more than 10% bitrate saving. So it just shows that we cannot rely on objective metrics like SSAM and PSNR to, to, to measure uh, quality metrics. Especially one explanation is that this, these are some uh, only spatial metrics, so they don't m try to measure uh, temporal uh, uh, artifacts like uh, pumping or uh, flickering and stuff like that. So to summarize my talk, um, so yes, the motivation was try first to highlight and to point out the difficulty of comparing video codecs and try to identify the key points um, that can uh, end up with a confusing result. First, uh, comparing the difference between uh, video standard versus encoder implementation, uh, non-normative encoding optimization versus normative coding tools. Uh, target application and codec configuration and the kind of metrics used for the measurement and the test seconds used. Um, in terms of objective performance analysis, so we report 10% uh, bitrate saving uh, for AV1 for the same SSM quality, but at the price of 50 ta 55 time encoder increase, uh, roughly the same time in terms of decoding runtime increase, uh, decoding runtime. And uh, for GEM, uh, we report a 27% uh, bitrate saving for same SSM quality and a 10 time uh, encoder runtime increase. So from this objective analysis, uh, GEM as VVC reference point, uh, output as the best technology for compressed beyond, compression beyond HEVC. If we go back to the subjective quality assessment of HEVC versus AV1 compressions, so we, the main trend is that we have a near, simil, near similar quality at same bitrate for both streams, both compression, with a slight advantage to HEVC for the considered test set and bitrates that we use. Uh, if we go more in detail, that we, 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 we show that uh, AV1 suffers from strong temporal artifacts and blurring, while HEVC suffers from more spatial blocking and ringing artifacts. Uh, overall, uh, the AV1 objective gain on coding, effici coding efficiency do not translate uh, into subjective quality gains. If I conclude to try to draw some perspective, like uh, first, we think that AV1 needs further work, I mean time, uh, to improve first the runtime encoding uh, in order to allow practical software implementation. And today, uh, we think that AV1 does not technically uh, justify a codec change. And we have seen that VVC uh, seems to be the most promising uh, technology beyond HVC with ab availability by October 2020. So thank you, and I'm open for questions. Hi, I was interested in how you tuned X265 in there, because it, be, uh, it has modes that can tune for PSNR or tune for SM or can tune subjective quality with its rate control mode, and you sort of turned on off all the stuff that would actually make it be well suited for either objective or subjective metrics there, and also turning off performance stuff and B-frame type 
Mm -hmm. All that stuff's going to wind up reducing all both objective and subjective scores relative to what it's capable of. So basically, we use uh, so we have the command line in the paper, um, yeah. and so we use uh, the most uh, the slowest um, preset mode. So one one preset mode, which is well known to be a very efficient. And as I said, we try to not uh, use a, a tuning, tuning preset like PCNR tune or SSM tune uh, in order to not misconfigure uh, one, uh, the codex in a certain way. What we're trying to do uh, in a bit is uh, to align the GOP structure with the HM in order to be uh, as fair as possible. And also, for all the codex, we disable all non-normative algorithms, like adaptive, uh, local, local adaptive quantization, stuff like that, which is available in x but also available recently in HM or GEM. And all these uh, algorithms are some non-normative tools. It means that it could translate to any implementation, to any standards. So if you want to have a fair comparison, you need to disable these tools, because it's not related to a standard. It just relies to one encoder implementation. Uh, so your goal is really to get a comparison of bit streams, not a comparison of encoders. Yeah. Yeah, my goal and the goal in general was to just to highlight that we have to take care when we try to compare codex of what belongs to the standard and what belongs to uh, encoding optimization, optimization, which is non-normative, that you mm. can implement in any standard. I can design an, an adaptive quantization algorithm that could fit to RV1, X265, or HM, or GEM. Usually, HM or GEM don't have a, a very... Um, high level of encoding optimization because these solutions are some proprietary solution. It's what makes a uh, difference between encoder founders. So basically it's what we sell, as, my, as media kind is what we sell uh, to, to, our, to our customers. So usually you don't provide uh, this algorithm to the reference model. So it's what we try to okay. clarify. Yeah. That makes this. sense. Mm. Because I guess even people quoting in this paper and other ones where they're uh, you know, trying to extrapolate what real world uh, implementations of encoders of the streams are going to look like, which would all, never use fixed QP and always use rate control and have a lot of those other things in there. So it's, uh, yeah, even in, so if you compare the bit stream capacity, that doesn't say a lot about what the actual real world encoders can do and also doesn't capture how the different features of the, uh, the different tools we use in different ways in a bit stream format can be used to the advantage of all that. So, which is one thing we saw with MPEG 4 part two is like, a, it had like adaptive quantization, but it was designed as a really weird, like even number offset way that made it practically hard to use. But anyway, okay. It'd be interesting to see a comparison of best available encoders for each to show what we could go with it there, but that's gonna be apples and kumquats at best. Yeah, yeah, but for us, it's, does it make sense to, to, to try to do a, a best available? Because we, we will not provide our, our implementation of encoders, so. Right. No. Yeah, you answered your question well. I think. Hi, uh, Alan Stein, Technicolor. Uh, thank you for, mm -hmm. uh, for, for doing this work. Um, I, I am most struck by the, uh, the 55 times um, encoding time for AV1. Do, have you profiled that code? Do you know where all the time is being spent? Uh, we don't. We are currently profiling all the all the different modules to see uh, which one are uh, costing the much in terms of encoding complexity. Uh, as an additional information, what I can provide you, I said you that uh, we disable all uh, AVX2 implementation uh, acceleration in AV1, but for every codex. Just for information, if you re, re enabled uh, this acceleration, uh, you improve the encoding runtime by a factor 12. Thank you. Okay. But again, it's non-normative, so it could be it could apply to a chain. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please tap the like button and also subscribe to our channel to receive notifications when we add new content. For more information about us, please visit simpty.org. We'll see you next time.